Hi, I'm Phil Cook, and today we have a very special session. I'm gonna be talking to Dave Adamson, a friend of mine from North Point Community Church in Atlanta. He's a social media pastor, an online pastor, a brilliant photographer and writer. We're gonna have a terrific, terrific time talking about how the digital world is changing the church today. We're actually taping during the COVID-19 virus, but wherever you listen, whenever you listen, it could be far in the future, we're constantly facing a crisis. The question is, how can the digital world, how can platforms and social media platforms and online platforms help us navigate those crises? So stay tuned. It's going to be an incredible time. Okay, well, I am thrilled to have Dave Adamson here. This is a great opportunity. We've been talking about this for a long time, and now we decided to actually hook up in this uh, shutdown period. It's we're, we're doing more Zooms than ever. And, and by the way, you should know that we're recording this during the coronavirus shutdown. So, uh, but we're going to be talking about issues that will impact you way beyond this. So please yep. stay tuned. Dave, welcome. This is great to have you. Hey, thanks, man. It's so good that we can finally make this happen. I'm thrilled. I'm thrilled. So I want to start by putting you on the radar just a little bit. Uh, by the way, if you don't know Dave, um, he is the most inspirational guy in the world on social media out there. He's a really a master at it, and I follow him. I've read all of his devotionals on YouVersion, and just a really brilliant guy, and a great photographer, I might add. But your official title is social media pastor. Tell me a little bit about what that means. Essentially what it is, is it's uh, taking that opportunity to leverage the front door or the new front door of the church, which is really is social media now. You know, we used yeah. to say that um, people uh, are first going to connect with your church on a website or something along those lines. But for the past few years, it's certainly been uh, social media. You know, one of the things I always say is that uh, pe social media allows people to connect with your church before they connect within your church. And so we we uh, really wanted that to be a pastoral position because, you know, in so many ways, uh, people are leveraging social media now to make connections with people. It's not, you know, it, it goes beyond just uh, a tool to promote things. I really see social media yeah. as a tool to pastor people rather than just promote things. And so from that point of view, yeah, we wanted it to be a pastoral position so that we could connect with people and then help maybe even get them the help that they they need. I remember when I first joined, uh, first got into this position, uh, we had uh, on one of our church campuses here in Atlanta, somebody had reached out to us around Christmas time and had said that, hey, could you be praying for me? Because, um, you know, my husband has left and I've got three kids at home and, and you know, Christmas is going to be really hard for us. And so I was able to reach out to this person. And then we had a team of people go around and connect with her and provide Christmas for her and her family. Oh. And so that's the sort of thing that can happen if we start leveraging social media in the in the Capital City Church as a pastoral tool instead of just promotional tool. And, and so, you know, I'm really thrilled that I get the opportunity to do that, to leverage the technology of our day to connect people with God and to connect people with the church and connect people with each other. And when I think about it in that frame and when I think about it through that lens, I just keep thinking, Phil, that, that it's just like the Apostle Paul, right? He used the technology of his day to connect people to God and connect people with each other in the church. And the technology of his day was letter writing. The technology of our day is YouTube, it's podcasts, it's Instagram, it's Twitter, it's Facebook, it's Instagram stories, it's TikTok. Yeah. So the church needs to be leveraging these tools to reach people and just do what the Apostle Paul did. That's great. Well, you know, it's funny. I, I, I'm still getting pastors that will tell me, you know, I don't know, this digital thing, this online thing is not ministry. That's not ministry. And we, oh. what we need is real fellowship. And I, and I say, look, if you're under 30 years old, that is fellowship for you. Online yeah. is fellowship. That is actually a community getting together. And so it's a real disconnect between a lot, a lot of older pastors. Now, you work with Andy Stanley out of North Point Community Church in Atlanta. Correct. Uh, did, Andy, did Andy catch on to this idea right away? Well, he was actually the one <laughs> that put me into this position, actually. Uh, when I first started at North Point, I was actually a media producer and I was creating uh, media video content um, for the church and, and for, you know, Andy's messages. And um, it was uh, three months into the job. Uh, you know, you get a performance evaluation as a new employee. But the way that North Point does it, the way that Andy does it, that's a little bit different is instead of 
uh, North Point, uh, you know, critiquing me, it was me critiquing North Point. He really flips the script on that. Like he wants us, he wants as a new person, you know, he's, he says that I've got a window of time where I can see things in the organization that people who have been there for a long time can't see. And so he really wants to poke those questions and in poking those questions uh part of what i said was was stuff about online church and and social media and he, i remember he called me into his office and uh i remember walking in thinking i'm about to get fired like i was too honest in my evaluation um but he said no hey i want to i'm going to change your position and you're going to be our first uh, ever social media pastor and you know that was that was five years ago five and a half years ago so you know, Andy's really ahead of the game, I think, in a whole lot of ways, because now every church has somebody who's running their social media for them. And, and you know, I just I, I'm just thrilled that I get the opportunity to do what I do. Well, the thing I like about you is you view it as a pastoral role. And, you know, Andy does, too, I'm sure. And, and the thing is, every, you know, there's so many churches in America that have a social media person or a social yep. media consultant or a social media expert. But they're, they're essentially using social media as a megaphone for the church, announcing when the services start, when the Christmas play is going to be, or, you know, posting scriptures and clips from the pastor. They're not really viewing it as a way to minister to people. So I would love to see more social media per- people get into that pastoral mindset, because that's a, that's a huge leap forward, I think. Yeah, I completely agree. And, you know, it's interesting that you say it like that because you're right. A lot of uh, churches uh, will leverage social media in the same way that a lot of businesses do, which is to leverage it as a megaphone. But if we can start to leverage it as a telephone and have two-way conversations rather than that one-way conversation, that's when we really get the engagement side of the this of this platform, of these channels that we have. But unfortunately, we see it you know, it's called social media, but we don't see it as social. We see it as just media. And so, in, you know, what the church has done for a long time is we've used social media, you know, to invite people to events when we should be using it to invite people to conversations. Because when we do that, that's when we start to connect. And that's when we can really have an impact in the local community. I had a, a, a pastor I was working with last year that uh, I said, look, you know, when you post something on Facebook or Instagram, wherever, and people respond, go back and talk to some of those people. Yeah. I mean, it never occurred to him that he would want to do that. And yeah. so he did. And the first person he responded to, her next post was, oh, my gosh, my pastor talks to me on Facebook. This is the most amazing church I've yeah. ever been to. I mean, she yeah. was thrilled. And yeah. you don't realize yeah. just how powerful that is. Yeah, and that time investment was was probably nothing on the front end, but it had such a big payoff on the other side of that um, on yeah. the other side of that post. The same thing happens to me, man. When when my teenage daughters get a post from their student pastor or something along, or if they post something and the the church responds or the student pastor responds, I mean, it's a big deal in those moments. So it's, yeah, it's very interesting how little investment you make can have such a big payoff in somebody's mm-hmm. life. Yeah. Well, you know, let me, let me let me ask you something along the lines for for social media people, media people, other guys at church. One of my things is I encourage churches to have their leadership team create their own identities on social media, post it. I mean, you you, you could follow you and not even yeah. really know your connection to to North Point so much. I mean, as you have your own identity, you're telling your own story, you're, you know, ministering to people in so many ways. And I think a church really can grow if the executive pastor has a, a you know platforms out there, if the youth director has platforms, if the media producer has platforms, that yeah. they're doing their own thing because that just builds the momentum. I think of the whole church. Is that what? Would you agree with that? Yeah, I think there's a. I think the power in it for me comes from the fact that you know people connect with individuals, not necessarily organizations. It's like me saying, you know, if I have a burger store in Atlanta and I tweet out that I've got the best burgers in Atlanta. No, nobody really cares about that. Um, because of course I meant to say that I've got the best burger in Atlanta, but you know, that's why we, that, but we live in a culture that is based on things like Yelp reviews, right? Where you go to everybody else who are individuals and you get their impressions. I know for me, if I'm shopping on Amazon, I'm looking at the reviews. I want to see, and there's two products side by side. I'm going for the one with the most five or four and a half stars or something along those lines, because I I I respect the individuals. I I respect that opinion much more. So I think it can be the same with church. You know, I think the churches need to have their own uh, corporate uh, page, their own corporate identity when it comes to social media. 
for sure. But if you can have individuals speaking into that, then yes, I think it just carries a lot more weight to bring more people in. So one of the things, you know, I love to do, and, and I, I guess I, to a certain extent, I stole this from one of our pastors named Jeff Henderson, um, you know, always being for the local community. And yeah. so I see him all the time posting from his, you know, he's the lead pastor of a big church in a, in a place called Gwinnett County here in Atlanta, uh, in Georgia. And he will post about the local high school who won the, you know, the football carnival or something along the, those lines. He'll post about the first responders. And I love that he leverages that platform that he has to be for the community. And so, you know, for my own stuff, I love when I can, A, shout out our churches and, and invite people to come to our church services online or something along those lines from my own platform. But I also love being able to shout out individuals and, and really elevate them in their position. So I think the way that we use social media you know, you know how it is, man. You, you don't want to go to a party and, and talk to somebody who just talks about themselves all the time. But you, you do like going to a party and, and have somebody who's talking about other people a lot more. So I think that's how we need to leverage social media too, as, as Christians, as pastors, but also just the regular lay people in the community that's in, in our church communities. I think that's what we need to be doing as well. Now, let me ask you what, you know, as I said at the beginning, we're in the middle of this COVID-19 crisis. And and, yep. and and the truth is, when this is over, we'll have other crises. We had a financial crisis years ago. We're, we're always going through some problem, some challenge. What is, what is the role of an online pastor, a social media pastor? What, how can you help when a church or a community is in a crisis like this? What How have you been shifting your strategy and your thinking? Yeah, well, it's been it's been interesting to see the capital C church shift during this period, right? Because the, there's always been a lot of churches out there that had online platforms would be streaming either through a church online platform or through Facebook or something along those lines. But there was a vast majority of churches who did not have any online presence from a service point of view. And instantly overnight, they literally became multi-site churches because yeah. they scrambled to, to get their streams up and running, right? That was the biggest thing. If we're going to survive this, then we need to have an online stream of our services. And so that was the first port of call for most churches. Now, I think, you know, five weeks in, four weeks in, five weeks in, the conversation for, that I'm having with a lot of churches, both in the US and in the UK and in Australia, it's all about the conversation is starting to shift now to not just how do I stream my services, but how do I do ministry online? How do I connect with people when I can't actually connect with them physically? And I think that's a space that I've always lived in because I love being able to leverage technology to pastorally care for people. Um, and so for me, I think this is a really exciting time because we are becoming a place uh, we, we are becoming an organization that, you know, when I say organization, I mean the capital C church right. that is so focused on connecting with people using online mediums. And so when this is all said and done, Phil, when we're, when we're back in, uh, you know, into our churches and things like that, there's a couple of things that I hope stick. One of them is the power that we have to stay in engaged with people throughout the rest of the week. You know, most churches connect with the people in their church community for one hour on Sundays, right? But we've been able to leverage for years now social media to stay connected for the other 167 hours of the week. But I think we've only just, you know, as, an, as a, yeah. a group, we've only just learned that. So that's one of the things that I hope sticks. The other one is, you know, for years, I, I remember I, I grew up in a uh, totally non-Christian house. I wasn't a Christian until I was a senior in high school. And I remember um, even before I started going to church, people would say, no, church is not a, a building, it's a, it's a people. But now that's taken on a literal, <laughs> the church is not the building. And I hear these uh, church leaders and pastors now saying, well, you know, when the church reopens, and I keep saying, no, no, the church is not reopening because the church is never closed. Yeah. And so this has this mentality has to continue after this is all back in and lockdowns are over and quarantines over. I really hope that that's one of those things that stick that people will see that the church is not a building. It is the people and we can stay connected with the people through uh, digital platforms like Facebook, Instagram, uh, Zoom, whatever. Yeah, it's early. It's interesting. Early on uh, when this happened, I, I remember that. Um, right before the shutdown, um, I saw a statistic from LifeWay Research that 41% of churches in America had never offered any services, anything online, yeah. for almost half. 
Now that's dramatically changed. But part of my message to pastors is, look, it's not just what happens on Sunday. It's how do you stay connected during the week? And I'm encouraging them to get out there on Instagram, on Facebook. And and the thing is, it doesn't have to be super polished. It doesn't have to be super professional. Just pick up your phone and have a conversation with your people. Just keeping that connection, I think, is so incredibly important. And I, I just find that pastors that aren't used to that, once they start, they love it They're, because they start getting a response from people and, and they just are having a great time. So you're exactly yeah. right. You think people, you know, learning to shift to this whole digital mindset is something that we're not going to stop doing when we when this thing is over. Hopefully we'll be able to continue and, and just take it to another level. That's it. Yeah, that is my hope. Com- That's my hope completely. And part of my hope for that is, you know, research will show that even people who are deeply committed as Christians, uh, you know, have stopped going to church. Um, Research shows that the average person goes to church once every four or even five weeks. I know in Australia, it's like once every six weeks. And these are the people who are committed. So even the committed churchgoers aren't going to church anymore. But I think what's going to happen out of this is as people start to leverage YouTube Live, Facebook Live, podcasts, um, Instagram Lives um, to connect with more people, what they're going to start to realize is that it's okay if somebody in your church community shows up uh, on once the first Sunday of the month, then the second Sunday of the month, because they're traveling, they watch the message on demand that week. And then the following week after that, maybe they catch it on podcast on Monday. And then the week after that, they catch it on YouTube, like on Wednesday, because they were so busy during the week. When we get to that level of understanding that that's how people are consuming our content, I think two things happens. The first one is we realize that church church attendance is not decreasing, it's decentralizing. People are just accessing your content in other places and other ways. And the second thing is that's when church, capital C church, starts to move towards what, what I call an omni-channel approach to church. It's not just that physical is the only channel that people can access your content. It's been like this for years, but the sh- church hasn't made that shift. Two, uh, two years ago, Phil, I wrote a blog post uh, called uh, Church As We Know It is, well, I didn't call it this, but I, I gave it a different title when I first wrote it, but it was talking about omni-channel church and how we have to almost be like Home Depot, where Home Depot went online and a whole bunch of uh, franchise owners were upset because they're like, you're going to take business away from us. But what they actually realized was people um, still spent money in the stores. They just shopped online ordered it and then went in and, and picked it up from the local store, right? That's omni-channel. They, they access it online, but then they go and pick it up and they realize that people were taking less steps inside their Home Depot building, but they were actually spending a lot more money. That's omni-channel. So I wrote a blog post about this about a year later, Fox News picked it up and they wrote, they gave it the headline, churches we know it is dead. Here's what's next. And <laughs> And Phil, I can tell you, first of all, I was shocked that Fox News would have picked it up. That that kind of yeah. blew me away. But there was like, I think to date, there's 6,000 comments on it or something like that. And I can tell you that 5,990 of those comments are dead against me and my, my opinion. Yet now this is the reality that we're all living in. This has actually come to fruition now. You know what I mean? And yeah. people at the time were saying, well, this is a Hebrews issue because we should not give up meeting together. And I always thought it's not a Hebrews issue. To me, it's a Mark issue because, you know, in the Gospel of Mark, Jesus yeah. says, go into all the world and preach the good news. Well, all the world includes YouTube. It includes Instagram. It includes Facebook. And that's where we have to be. So I always have that mentality to it. That's really, really good. And, you know, it is funny. I am getting a number of pastors call, calling me saying, okay, so I've spent the last month telling everybody how awesome online worship is. How am I ever going to get them back in the building, you know, when this thing is over? Mm-hmm. And uh, I agree with you 100% that some, we won't. I don't think we will. Uh, yeah. On the other hand, I also tell them if listening to your message is online is all that you're good for, yeah. uh, you've got other problems in your church. If there there's no other reason for people to come and gather together and, and uh, on your campus, on your building, so I, I think it's a, a very complex issue, but I, yeah. I feel really good about it. And I think it's interesting that, that I, I think the greatest thing for me in all this is pastors have finally realized that online audience out there is a legitimate congregation. Yeah. And I need to be more intentional about engaging with them. I need to be more serious about engaging with them. And if nothing else, you know, if you could say anything good has come out of this whole virus crisis, 
that it's it's made pastors aware that that's a real congregation, that's a real audience, and I need to respect them and engage with them, and that's a great thing. I totally agree. I'm, I'm so glad that you're having those conversations. Yeah, it's it's an, it's an interesting thing. So let me go back. Let's go back a little bit with you. You started as a sports yeah. reporter, right? <laughs> yeah, uh, you've done some research. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, um, you know, I, uh, like I said, I grew up in a, in a uh, non- in a completely unchurched house and and had never dreamed that I would ever be a pastor. And all I ever wanted to be was a sports reporter. And so, you know, I, I got a degree in, in journalism and literature and, and worked my way through uh, local newspapers to local magazines to national magazines. And then I became the uh, youngest ever editor of Australia's highest sports selling magazine. And it was when that happened that a local, you know, we've got three major networks in Australia, same, same as you guys here. And, and um, one of them came and did a report on me. And the producer of that said, hey, you'd be good on TV. You should, have you thought about that? And I went, no, again, but yeah, let's do it. And so for the last seven or eight years I was in Australia, I was a sports reporter and producer for a show that was basically our equivalent of ESPN Sports Center. And um, wow. it was after doing that for like seven or eight years that, I actually got a call from Connecticut uh, from ESPN and, and they said, hey, we'd like to fly you out and interview you. We've seen your show reel and we'd love to interview you for a job on SportsCenter and it would require you moving to the US. And so I flew out and, um, you know, did the interview, came back and uh, about a couple, about three weeks later, they offered me a position and my wife and I started praying about it. And it was a funny story. We, we'd never really fasted before. And so my wife in her wisdom said, hey, we should fast about this decision. I said, great, great idea. How long should we fast for? She said, well, three days seems very biblical. Let's do it for three days. <laughs> and so we fasted for three days. And on, you know, at the end of that, we got together and she said, hey, what do you think? Should we take this job? And I said, you know what? I, I could go either way. It seems like the next logical step in my sport, my career. So that seems like a good thing, but you know, it's leaving Australia. That's a huge call. So I'm either way. And I said, what about you? Did God say anything to you? And she said, yeah, God spoke to me after about four hours and said that you shouldn't take the job. And she said to me, are you angry with me for saying that? And I said, no, the only reason I'm upset is because you got an answer after four hours, but you made me not eat for three days. That's what I'm upset <laughs> about. <laughs> um, so yeah, at that point in life, I was like, well, what am I going to do with myself? I've just turned down my dream job. And so I reached out to a pastor who ironically, I'd been listening to on podcast. He lived in the, in the US. He was from New Jersey, a, a place called Morristown, New Jersey. And I'd been listening to him for six months as I drove into the studio and back every single day. And so when I was in this place of, you know, a, a crossroad in my life, I reached out to the guy who I considered to be my pastor who lived on the other side of the world. And so I emailed him. And much to my surprise, he said, hey, here's my cell number. Can you call me tomorrow? And so I called him. Within two hours of talking with him, he, he said, hey, I want to fly you out because I think you're the guy I've been looking for. And he flew me out to become an online pastor. So I started this online church for that, uh, that church in 2008. And here's the funny thing. 2008, not many churches were talking about, um, right. you know, doing online church. In fact, the only one that I knew of that I reached out to was Life Church. And there was a guy there called Brandon Donaldson at the time. He was the online pastor. And he said, hey, why don't you come and visit? So I, we did that. And then he said, I'm going to add you to this uh, group of online pastors. And I was the eighth person into that group. So when I started this, when I started building this church with this incredible team I had around me, there was uh, seven other online pastors in the U.S. that we knew of. So, yeah, I've been doing this for a while now. <laughs> Unbelievable. And how did you meet Andy? Uh, so, you know, uh, <laughs> the funny thing is we first saw Andy Stanley speak uh, at Hillsong Conference in Sydney long before we'd even thought okay. about, you know, while I was still a sports reporter. And I remember my wife saying, man, this guy's really good. And he was like, he was so, the way that he structured his messages were so intellectual and it really caught my attention because that's one of the pathways I have to, to God is when I learn new things. And he just put it in such a, a, a real, a frank and intellectual way that I really connected with it. And so we had been watching North Point for a long time. And when we moved to the US, we still watch North Point. And um, I, we actually, <laughs> at the church I was at in New Jersey, we interviewed a guy <clears throat> uh, for a lead pastor position of a new campus from North Point. 
he got the job, he accepted, he moved. But just before he moved, he said, hey, why don't you come down to North Point for my last week and I'll introduce you to their online people. I'll introduce you to their worship people. And so I did that and made some friends. And one oh. thing led to another. And about three years later, they offered me a position and I got to fly down and do that. It and was a dream. On staff as a, what kind of pastor did you come on staff as? I came on staff at North Point, not as a pastor at all, as a media producer, purely doing, uh, co you know, content for in-services and things right. like that. You know, the, the title packages that Andy has at the start of his messages, that's what I was doing as part of this incredible creative services team. And then three months in, I had that evaluation and Andy changed my job. <laughs> <laughs> so let me ask you a question. A lot of pastors, you know, may be listening or watching this and wondering, is it time for me to have a position as a social media pastor or an online pastor. I know, I know at Life Church, you know, you're, you're exactly right. They have a guy that actually hosts the, the live stream. Yeah. You know, Craig does the preaching, but they have an online pastor that hosts that. And should, when should pastors start thinking about maybe it's time for us to make a move like that? Any advice? Yeah, look, I think uh, what a lot of pastors typically did before this was they didn't think they needed to have an online presence because maybe they were too small or maybe they were just so locally based. But one of the advantages of having somebody in a position like mine uh, is that you're able to connect with the people who are closest to you right now, like it, within your community, you're able to leverage social media to do that. Yeah. So having somebody who wakes up in the morning thinking, how can I connect with the people in our community and connect them to our church? And, you know, I've got so many fantastic stories of the way that we've leveraged, even a church the size of North Point has leveraged social media to connect with people. I remember one time uh, I was doing uh, social media hands-on for one of our campuses, our furthest North campus. Campus. And I, I was scanning through, and this is one of the things that I, I, I often will do is I was scanning through Twitter, through um, certain hashtags like depressed, uh, sad Monday, stuff like that. So, and you can search within a 10 mile radius of your church building. This is a tip like get on Twitter and start searching for those hashtags or get on Twitter and start searching for the hashtag uh, moving day, new in town, new job, stuff like that. And search within a 10 mile radius of your church and then respond to those people. Well, this one time I was searching for a, I think it was a, I think it was called depressed or something, hashtag depressed. And I saw this person had posted, Hey, hashtag depressed today because our dog ran away. If you've seen this dog, could you please let us know? And so what I did was I retweeted that tweet from the church's, Twitter account. Within a couple of minutes, the lead pastor of that campus called me up and said, hey, um, can you, like, what's the deal with this retweet of this lost dog? I don't understand. I said, hey, can you just trust me on this? And he said, yeah, 100%. <laughs> well, three days later, that same person tweeted at the church and said, hey, we found our dog thanks to you guys retweeting it to a much broader audience. The person who found the dog said they saw it on your Twitter account. Now, that for me was a huge win. Now, do I know what happened after that with those people? No, right. I don't. But here's what I do know. One day, the, that couple might get to the point where, you know, something's going wrong in their life. Maybe they've lost a job. Maybe, they've, um, maybe they lose their dog again. Maybe they uh, have, a, have an accident. Maybe they're not going so well in their marriage. Something along those lines. And when they go, who can I go to for help? What about that church that tweeted about our dog that time? Let's go there. And I honestly believe there's going to come a point <laughs> We're at North Point. Somebody's going to get up to do a baptismal video and they're going to say, hey, I was far from God, but I found out about North Point. I found out about this church through social media because I did this or I posted about a lost yep. dog or I was scrolling through YouTube one day and a video popped up that answered the question that I had about the Bible, about Jesus, about right. faith. And so I started watching more and then I got connected to the church. I believe that's going to happen one day. And that happens when churches focus on leveraging the technology of our day to connect with the community. I know a lot of churches, a lot of pastors will think, well, that's only for those churches that are really hyper relevant. Yeah. I think we have in the church, we have a wrong perception, a wrong definition of the word relevant. We think relevance is having pretty moving lights on stage, having smoke in the auditorium, um, you know, having a yeah. leader who has got skinny jeans and a really deep V. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's not relevant because here's the thing, Phil, if I've been in lost in the desert for two weeks and as I come out, you're standing there and you've got a glass of water 
you are the most relevant person in the world for me. Correct. And so the church is relevant in the community when they're meeting the needs of the people in the community. So having an online presence just allows us to do that. Even now, I think um, it's great that churches are uh, getting online and, and streaming their services. Fantastic. Now start leveraging social media to impact yeah. the local community that you're in. You know, find out the people who don't have toilet paper and, and go and drive a roll, you know, a couple of rolls of toilet paper over over to them and say, hey, I saw that you posted about that. We just wanted to bless you. Yeah. No strings attached yeah. because that's going to have the biggest impact during this time. It's not just about online. It's about what's happening offline as well and that interconnection between offline and online so it becomes an omni-channel experience. That's a great word about the, a great idea about the word relevant. I actually did a blog post a couple of years ago, and I did, I looked up the history of relevant because you're exactly right. It's not about wearing skinny jeans, having moving <laughs> lights, having a fog machine. Really, the history of the word is about being the right tool for the job or being the right answer at that moment. Exactly. And you're exactly right. A glass of water at the right moment is relevant. Whatever. Yeah. Using the right tool, being the right answer, providing the right resource, whatever. That's what relevance really is. And I think totally. we understood that. We're not, it's not about how you decorate something or how you dress. It's really about who you are. Yeah. I think that's really, really important. So now, can I, I just it. can I just clarify well, one yeah, thing? Please. I'm not against deep Vs and I'm not against smoke machines and I'm certainly not against skinny jeans. In fact, Phil, you're, you're in my mutual friend, John Bach. He'll watch this and he'll go, he'll say, dude, Aussie Dave always wears skinny jeans. Um, so yeah. I'm all about that. I'm just saying, I think we need to redefine that word. Yeah, good point, good point, Val. Now, I will say I'm against skinny jeans on certain people though. However, <laughs> John Bach would be one that would not, should not wear skinny jeans ever. No comment. We'll just say that. <laughs> um, okay, so here's another question. You're an incredibly accomplished photographer and I love the fact that you integrate photography into what you do. I don't think enough people think hey, I'm a talented writer, I'm a talented musician, I'm a talented whatever, and integrate that into mm. what they do. People just don't ever, that's just, people don't think about it. Tell me about how you started getting your photography kind of intertwined into the work you do on social media. Yeah, so uh, I only started photography eight years ago. Um, my wife brought me a camera as a gift and said, hey, I think you need a creative outlet. And so I just started you know, taking photos. And I realized that I'd led a lot of photographers in my days as a journalist, for example, um, you know, as an editor, I was, I was directing photographers, but I hadn't actually done it myself. And so I just started picking it up and doing it. And, you know, didn't really think much of it at the time until um, a few years in, we learned that our youngest daughter has dyslexia. And she, uh, at the time, you know, she was, she was pretty young and she, we would take her to church and she was the first person to put her hands up in the air during worship. She was out, she would pray out loud at night and her sisters would listen to her prayers because she was so like into, into praying for people and very right. intercessory and, and very, very aware of the spiritual. Um, but she couldn't, you know, she struggled to read the Bible because of her dyslexia. And so I remember one day I was showing her a photo on the wall and I, I weaved that photo into a story about Psalm 23 and then later that night or, or the next day, she, she recounted the deep theological thing that I'd shared with her almost word for word. She would remembered it because she saw the image. And that was when I went, you know what? I'm going to take photos for my daughter and I'm going to post those to Instagram so that, you know, long after I'm gone, she's going to be able to learn everything her dad knew about Jesus and the Bible. That's great. From my Instagram feed. And, and, you know, so really I started it for her and I started it for all of my girls. I didn't know that it would, you know, I didn't know where it would go. I didn't know that it would start <laughs> impacting a whole bunch of people around the world. I didn't know that a publisher would see it and, and want to do a book based off my Instagram. I was just serving, I was just being a dad, you know, and trying to teach my kids stuff that I knew about Jesus. So yeah, it's, it's, it's very humbling, very humbling. That's amazing. That's amazing. So, so tell us about your book, Chasing the Light. That's a great, that great example of how you incorporated it into that. Tell us about that book. Yeah, so a publisher saw my Instagram and said, hey, I'd love to turn that into a book. And I didn't really understand it at the time because people could get all that stuff for free on Instagram. <laughs> but he compiled it and I added a few extra things in there and shared the story about uh, my daughter in it as well. And and uh, so, yeah, that got turned into a book. And then uh, it was during that process as I was, you know, this was growing me in my faith as well. That's when I first started going to uh, Israel, going to the Holy Land yeah. and, and took my cameras and started taking photos there as well and started to learn some Hebrew. And, and as I started to do that, I started to incorporate that into some of the stuff that I wanted to teach my girls. 
And um, so then the publisher who did Chasing the Light came back, out back and said, hey, we want you to do a book called, um, I, I'd done a thing for you version called Seven Hebrew Words Every Christian right. Should Know. It's a reading plan on you version. And <laughs> funny, you know, I just wrote it and, and I was so thrilled that they would even publish it. <laughs> But then they call me at the end of the end of the year and say, "Hey, uh, yours was like the top ten most uh, subscribed to and completed reading plans on YouVersion this year." I'm what? And, and they said, "Yeah, we were actually having a chat, and somebody asked, who's this Dave Adamson guy?' Because you know the other top ten are Andy Stanley, Louis Giglio, like all these you right. know, Rick Warren, all these big Max Licato, like all these big names. And then there's this random unknown person. And so my publisher called me and said, "Hey, we want you to do a." do you think you could do 52 Hebrew words? We'll do a book called 52 Hebrew words every Christian should know. And I said, yeah, sure. I got 52 words. And so we did that. And that went like gangbusters. It was crazy. You know, I've been to Australia and been to a bookstore and there's my book right out the front. Like, again, I'm so humbled because I didn't, I didn't start becoming this. I, you know, I didn't set out to write a book. I just set out to teach my kids stuff about Jesus and then God kind of did the rest. But for me, this is a great example of what I think God does with us, right? And I think he's done it with you as well. I would love to know how he did this with you. He takes the skills that you have in your hand and he matches it with the vision he places in your heart. And that's when you're on, you know, those two things working together is what he starts to yeah. use. So for me, you know, the skills I had in my hand were skills I developed as a, you know, through college and, and working as a journalist and writing and then photography on top of that. And the vision of my, uh, that he's placed in my heart is just to teach people, help people get the most out of the Bible. And so yeah. we just paired them and I just started writing about the Bible using photos as almost like a, almost like a parable into the lesson. You know, people say that uh, there's a, there's an author, Shane Hips, he says that uh, words are like, brain protein images are like brain candy um and i 100 percent believe that like photos you think of instagram biggest social media platform on the planet right yeah it's built around images because images are the language of the 21st century and so yeah. i'm just leveraging that to reach people and god's doing some good things through it I'm, I'm just blessed and humbled to be part of it i agree i think the church is recognizing the power of video image still photos it's funny right I'm, close friend of mine, Ralph Winter, produced X-Men, Wolverine, Planet of the Apes, just a big major producer here in Hollywood, uh, hmm. told me one time, he said, I really believe that the filmmakers will become the worship leaders of the future. And he said, 100%. because the church is getting more and more understanding of how film works and video and still photography and that, uh, graphic design. And so yeah. I just, I'm glad, I'm thrilled to see churches embracing that stuff in a, in a much bigger yeah. way. I think that's so yeah. important. Yeah. So tell me, before we go, um, if you had to leave uh, pastors, church leaders, communication professionals with one thing, what, what, would, you, what would you leave them with today? Um, don't be afraid to leverage the technology of our day. That would be my big thing. And, yeah. and by technology of our day, I, I mean Instagram, I mean Facebook, I mean Twitter, I mean TikTok, but I also mean YouTube. Uh, and, and, you know, you know, you know, from conversations we've had in the past, YouTube is the thing that I'm most uh, focused on at the moment, yeah. because, you know, what a lot of churches don't realize is um, that YouTube is the second biggest search engine in the world, owned by the biggest search engine in the world. And if we can post content to that platform that is keyword optimized, um, you, people will find your content when they're going, uh, when they're searching for answers. And here's the thing that I know, YouTube, YouTube is the place people go to find answers for everything from fixing their car to fixing their marriage. And so when people come to the internet looking for answers to spiritual problems, because let's be honest, this is where, uh, you know, there's a whole generation. My girls are like this. I've got three teenage daughters, you know, they're 19, 17 and 15, and they're making major life discoveries and decisions in online spaces. And so if more churches, more pastors can get onto YouTube and post content there that answers those key specific questions and keyword optimize them around those specific yeah. questions. That's when we can actually make a huge difference, not just in today's, today's world, but even years from now, there's this great uh, Hebrew uh, proverb that I love. It says, uh, men, old men should plant trees whose shade they will never sit under. When I keyword optimize one of Andy Stanley's messages, 
that's what's in the back of my head. I might not ever see the benefit of this down the track, but years from now, this tree will provide shade for somebody when they're looking for it the most, when they need it the most in their life. And so I would say to pastors, don't, don't be scared of technology. In fact, embrace it as much as you can. Learn about it as much as you can. Talk with other pastors and church leaders and, and you know, I, come and talk to me. I will share everything that I, need, that, that I know. It's not much, but I can share it all. And then don't be afraid to use things like YouTube to reach a generation who are, you know, wandering far away from God. Well, two or three times today while you've been talking, I'm thinking, you know, it, it, it means pastors have to take the long view because it may not have immediate results. That post you do or that short film that you make or that video or whatever, it, it may be two, five, 10 years from now that it actually connects with somebody, but the internet doesn't go away. And it's funny, I have people that respond to blog posts I wrote 10, 12 years ago, yeah. and uh, it just comes up at the right you know, time. And so having that long view, I think is the critical thing. And you don't demand that your team shows results every single time, because sometimes yeah. it takes a long time for that to happen. So um, tell me, tell everybody where to, where to find you on social media. Tell us, give us the whole background about how to find you. Yeah, if you want to, um, if you want to find me on social media, I'm usually Aussie Dave at most places, Twitter, Instagram, A-U-S-S-I-E, Aussie, because I'm, because I'm Australian, uh, Aussie Dave uh, at, at all of those uh, channels. Um, also, you know, if you want to email me, yeah, I've got a website as well, which is daveadamson.tv. But if you want to email me, if you've got questions about social media, if you've got questions about how you can leverage YouTube or Instagram to reach more people, or, or if you want to ask questions about some of the stuff I shared today, just even about uh, that Twitter search stuff. Like I would love for you to email me and, and you can find me at dave.adamson at northpoint.org, dave.adamson at northpoint.org. Or one of the things I love to do, Phil, and, and if you would indulge me, I'm more than happy to do this as well. Please. I've started giving out my, my phone number on social media because, you know, people people uh, want to connect and they might, they need prayer, but they don't want to say it into a comment section. So if you, if you want to text me just to ask a question, 201-267-2156 is my, uh, is my phone number. Feel free, text me. And you know, if you need prayer, I would be more than happy to pray with you and pray for you as well and answer any questions that you might have. And if I don't know the answer, I'll try to direct you towards somebody who does. And it's probably going to be you, Phil, because you're a very smart <laughs> Absolutely. Well, thanks a lot. <laughs> Well, you know what? We'll put all that information in the notes section of the podcast, the YouTube yeah. channel, so you can get, get it easy. Just look at it there and we'll, we'll send it because I want more people to know what you're doing because I think oh, thanks, just following you gives me an enormous number of ideas. It, it makes me think and, and uh, oh. you know, it's kind of jolts me out of the, compre the preconceived ideas I have about certain things. And I was, well, I never thought of it that way. So I'd encourage people, follow Dave. It's, it's just really interesting to see what he's doing and I'm amazed. So thanks so much for being with us. I think this is incredible. Uh, I, I've gotten energized from just listening to you talk and I think it's a fantastic opportunity and, and I encourage people, I'll encourage people to share this with everybody they know because more churches, pastors need to hear this perspective on what's happening out there and how they can make an impact online. Thanks, mate. I really appreciate it. And I, I received that encouragement. Thank you so much. Well, it's been a great conversation today with Dave. And I just want to remind you, please share this with your friends. People need to understand this kind of information, particularly about how the digital world can impact reaching and making an impact out there around the world. It's so incredibly important. And, and you know, if you're listening to this or watching it during this crisis and you're rethinking your life, I'd encourage you to order my creative planner, the unique creative planner. You can find it on Amazon, Barnes and Noble, a multitude of places. And I'd encourage you to go check it out because, you know, this is a great time to start rethinking what our priorities really are. And when we emerge from this crisis, what direction are we going to be going? How confident will we be? And my planner, the great thing about that print creative planner is it helps you figure out what those priorities in your life really ought to be. Today, we're so overwhelmed with choices, options, ideas, that very often those are the very things that hold us back. And so my unique creative planner can really help you focus, 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 and figure out what today I need to accomplish. So I'd encourage you to order the unique creative planner. And again, share this with friends, uh, give us a rating. It really helps us go up in the ratings and more and more people can see it. And we really appreciate you joining us and being a part of this. And uh, until the next episode, I'm Phil Cook, and I'll see you then.